Uh, hi and welcome to Homo Dance, the channel on history and board games for another um, interview in a natural setting. And I'm here with uh, Brian Train. That's Hello. Who's in London, exceptionally for Connections UK, right? That's correct. First of all, thanks for taking the time to be on the channel. You've been on the channel a couple of times already. Uh, yes, yeah. For colonialism and uh, a book club, I think, if I remember well. Was it a book club or? Mm, I can't No, civilian I, victimization maybe yes, it was. Yes, it was civilian victimization. And yeah. then the uh, sort of colonialist, post-colonialist uh, e event, which was uh, very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me both times to these, uh, to these uh, particular interviews or, or panel discussions, I guess you would call them. Yeah. Um, so I'm allowed amazing. to invite you again, right? Oh, <laughs> any time. But it's amazing how uh, good you are at, at collecting better minds than mine to, to <laughs> come and talk on these panels. Uh, the, the, the colonialism one, for example, I know that was kind of to coincide with um, Mary Flanagan's book on, uh, on colonialism as it's reflected in board games. Um, so I was, I, I gotta admit, I felt quite intimidated at first knowing that I was going to be on a panel with Mary Flanagan and Cole uh, Verla and <laughs> uh, no, they, they, weren't, they weren't monsters at all. No, no. Uh, I didn't need to be afraid of them. Yes. It was a very, very pleasant uh, panel discussion. Maybe Jason was the scariest of that panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. So, I, I've, I, so on this one, I think this panel is a really good example of something that I try to do with the channel, which is uh, <coughs> collaborating with people in, in, my, in the community that I built around the channel. Uh, so on this one, it was uh, Luis Aguasvias, uh, who I was working with in securing the panel, who actually talked to me about Mary Flanagan's work. Through him, I got in contact with uh, their publishing, uh, the publishing uh, company and got access to the book and everything. And it all started from here. I knew I wanted to do it, but he helped me refine maybe the angles of the question, uh, come with a stronger panel. And I think one of the, my strengths is knowing my limits and finding the right people to support me on the, on the way. And both time I was really happy to, to have you on. It's always a pleasure because I, I, I think you were one of the first designers whose name I recognized uh, when I was really getting into, uh, into wargaming. I recognized and, and, and admired. Like there are a few names that when you discover something, when is it literature or anything, like you, can, you come up and you start to identify names and you're like, oh, I, I like that. <laughs> I like that person. I like what they do. Oh my uh, gosh! So, uh, so that was uh, that was nice. So I was really happy when I actually could manage to to get you on the show and everything. Realized that you were not a monster. Uh, so that was that was uh, that was also nice. But I think we started interacting with each other when Red Flag of Paris was announced on GMTP 500. You That's reached right. out, if I remember well, uh, because you were curious about the project mm -hmm. and you had written in. Strategy and Tactics, yes. an article about the Paris Commune, which was great. Like for me, it was like it, it meant a lot to see that um, uh, someone like you was in, were in, was interested in the in the project. I was really unsure about the overall project at that time, so it felt like I must be doing something good because someone like Brian is interested in it. So yeah. that was uh, that was uh, that helped quite a lot. So thanks for for that. I was really happy to hear that finally someone was actually doing a, a game on the Paris Commune. Yes. I had always been interested in the Commune and uh, I started writing articles uh, for uh, Strategy and Tactics magazine oh about 30 years ago, yeah. 1993, uh, and I wrote that article about 1997 or so. Uh, so it had been out for a while and I did all that research and normally when I do research on an article for strategy and tactics. When I do a major article, I also like to design a game on it yeah. because I like to have the, um, the, uh, the, the, the research do double duty mm. because this way with strategy and tactics, uh, if you publish the game, you get paid for the game design if it's published in the magazine and you get paid again for the article. Yeah, you know, smart. Uh, now, it's not a lot of money, but <laughs> not a lot of money plus not a lot of money makes a, a bit little more, more money. money. Yeah. You know. <laughs> That's and, so good. And yeah. sometimes it happens, well, about that time as well, um, I wrote a long article uh, about the 1848 revolutions yeah. uh, for strategy and tactics, and that was published about the same time. And <clears throat> I actually ended up designing a game uh, on the 1848 revolutions as a form of uh, creative procrastination, yeah. because I was researching the article and I was getting my way through writing it, 
and I just ran into a writer's block and I thought this is just getting really confusing and my writing is just not really making any progress. So I decided to sit down and just make a game of what I had done, you know, at least so far, to just sketch out the overline, uh, just the general overall outlines of what was going on as a way of trying to get my research kind of organized in my mind and what, and sort of like ranked in relevance. And when I was done, you know, sketching in that, that rough game, um, the, I had things in order in my mind enough to go back and finish the article. Yeah. And I, I didn't really, f I didn't ever formally publish that game until years and years later. Um, and it's still, you know, kind of one of my lesser works, um, but it's just interesting, you know, that uh, to me, I think that it was kind of a creative procrastination to, to just to, to, to move, to kind of outflank the writer's block by designing a game about something. And I didn't do that with the Commune article because I found the Commune article much easier to write. I didn't run into a block like that, but I still wanted to do a game because I've always been interested in urban warfare. Yeah. Um, maybe later we'll talk about Civil Power, yeah. uh, which was one of the very first games I designed back in 1991 or so, which is a tactical game on urban warfare, urban, you know, sort of irregular combat. And so the commune uh, is something that I've always been interested in, but I never really got it together to design a game about it. So when I finally learned that someone was finally doing a game about the commune and it was taking an angle from, well, because you, you develop the game and there's, there's several different dimensions to action. Yeah. It's not a straightforward military game. It's not just a straightforward siege game. There's, there's all these different dimensions to it. Um, <clears throat> so I was very happy to hear about that. And that's when I reached out to you yeah. and, uh, and expressed my interest in this. And I, I think you did a fantastic job. It's a fascinating game. The, the thing with it, though, based on what you wanted to do, is it, the game doesn't focus at all on the urban warfare part of it. Mm -hmm. It's almost um, invisible in the game. You do have the final crisis at the end of the game, but you don't really have that much tactics, uh, like the urban, uh, urban warfare tactics in it. You have a bit more with the extra cards that are going to be released in C3i, where you have more direct reference to the Bloody Week, uh, but it is still pretty um, abstracted. But I've been thinking a, a while about this, uh, and I think a, a game like We Are Coming, Nineve and, and things like this, and also Civil Power that I finally had the opportunity to play yesterday night, convinced me that there was still a game there, I think there are still a couple of games that I would like to do about the Paris Commune. I think that I would still like to do one about the internal politics of it, uh, the uh, internal conflicts and division uh, of, the, of the Commune itself, maybe in a more PAX style. But there is also an urban warfare game that I would like to do specifically about the Bloody Week mm -hmm. uh, and some of its aspects. I think that's something that I would like to talk about with you uh, in the future and figure out what could be a a good system for it because I think there is probably an interesting game here for me to wrap up my Paris Commune arc and, and so <laughs> I would have done the research once to do three games optimizing my research as much as I can that yeah. would be the good idea but that's a, a question for for later but we went straight into when we met each other so we went from the beginning of us interacting with each other but be, before going further in that I would be curious to hear about the beginning of you making games and I was wondering, so you were, were chatting actually just before I, I thought about taking up the camera and recording this. You were already talking about your beginnings as a war game designer. And you were saying that in the early 80s, you actually had designed your first hand-drawn uh, hex and counter game, something like this. And I was wondering what gave you the spark to start designing uh, war games? I guess in a word, dissatisfaction. Um, hmm. I started playing war games about 1979 or so. Um, the first war game I ever saw was about 1976. Uh, I was over at my friend's house and his uh, brother, elder brother had a copy of uh, an old SPI game called World War III, which is like a, has a map, it had a map of the whole world and you know most of the fighting took place in Europe or, or Asia uh, but it was a conjectural game of course and had all these mushroom cloud yeah. you know <laughs> markers and I saw this world map with these mushroom cloud markers on it and I thought oh this is pretty neat um, but it wasn't until a couple of years later that my favorite uncle sent me a copy of Tactics 2 mm. which is a very early Avalon Hill game very simple red versus blue kind of war game uh, sent it to me for Christmas 
And um, <clears throat> that started it, and I don't think my parents ever forgave him, you know. <laughs> oh, much later, my parents kind of came, came to... Uh, came, to turn came with to, it. Yeah, yeah they, they, they kind of came around eventually, but at first they couldn't figure out what Brian was doing with these little maps and little bits yeah. of cardboard, just bending over and staring at maps for hours on end, rolling dice once in a while. Um, and so that was... Uh, so I got into uh, playing these games, and I didn't have a lot of money. Um, to spend on games. What, what I was playing was whatever I could get my hands on because I lived in Victoria, Canada, which is not a very large city. There was yeah. only one shop that had anything to do with uh, games. And so I picked up, you know, cheaper science fiction games. You know, um, there's uh, metagaming micro games, which were very small, cheap things that came yeah. in a plastic envelope. Uh, this is 1980 by now, 1980, 1982. So there was no print and play uh, that could be done easily. Um, so it was just whatever you could get cheaply. And so it was, uh, I, it was interesting starting to get into this kind of thing, but the kind of games, the games on the kind of subjects that I wanted to play games on, uh, people just weren't doing that kind of work. I was interested in uh, sort of political military games, uh, there, uh, and I was interested in contemporary conflicts. And of course in 1980, uh, there were still, there was still um, games about the Vietnam War, you know, were streng verboten uh, among American publishers. Mm. Uh, there was, uh, well, one of the best games still out there on uh, guerrilla warfare is a game called Blood Tree Rebellion, which was published by Game Designers Workshop about 1979, 1980, around that time. The designer, uh, Lynn Willis, uh, put the game together, but it was a Vietnam game, yeah. and he brought it to Game Designers Workshop, and they said, this is a great game, but we can't publish it because it's about Vietnam. No one's going to buy it. So just take the setting uh, and change the, the gun platforms, You know, change the artillery fire bases to gun platforms, and change the B-52 bombers to orbital bombardment stations yeah. and that kind of thing, and set it on a different planet, You know, and, uh, and, and have the troops be corporate mercenaries and uh, you know just just change that setting and just change some of the terminology and uh, it was a successful game they sold quite a few copies of it and it's still one of the better games out there about insurgency um, but he had to give it you know a setting on a faraway planet in the far future to uh, in order to make it saleable so you know I, I went on through the 80s and uh, you know there were there were still very few games uh, about the kind of things that I wanted to play um, and it wasn't until I was in Japan in 1990 to 1992, and I was living on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, and I had, you know, very few to no games I brought with me. Mm. And I was living in kind of an out-of-the-way co uh, corner of Japan, so, you know, Tokyo was four or five hundred miles away, and uh, there are no game stores or anything like that. <clears throat> and I couldn't read Japanese anyway, uh, so I learned Go. But beyond that, I still wanted to start designing games. So I just uh, had a little bit of time and I sat down and I started designing games that I wanted to, on, on subjects that I wanted to play. So the first two games I designed uh, were in Japan. Yeah. Uh, and they were uh, Civil Power, which was a tactical mm -hmm. game about urban warfare, you know, mob warfare uh, and gang violence. And then there's a couple of sort of military uprising type situations. Uh, we talked about, a, there's a scenario about Bloody Week and the Commune, uh, a Warsaw scenario mm -hmm. as well. It's not really meant to be a, a sort of like urban kinetic combat kind of thing. It's more about um, uh, crowds fighting other crowds, fighting yeah. the police. So in that sense, uh, the rule set is actually derived a little bit more from medieval warfare um, because that's an aspect of urban warfare that comes out is that it's, in a sense, uh, it's, it's sort of like medieval warfare in, in the sense of sieges and of course because it's mostly unarmed combat yeah. uh, or crude missiles, you know, it's not complete gunplay then, you know, I, I, I found a lot of inspiration uh, in uh, sort of medieval rule sets or classical warfare. Yeah. Uh, and even if you watch a uh, video of, a, of, uh, of police, you know, moving against a riot, um, they're moving in phalanxes and, yes. or, or they get into a testudo formation. Mm. 
and uh, you know it's 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 almost like seeing Ancients. modern yeah. Romans you know like a like if, if you if you, you somehow uh, transported Romans forward in time mm. and said okay clear this street they would do <laughs> the same they would know exactly what to do yeah and I guess the the, the crowd would know what to do too um, so civil power is uh, one of the first games they designed the second one was a game called power play about a coup d'etat in an imaginary country and that was inspired by uh, a movie I happened to rent one one night from a Japanese video uh, a video store you know down the street and this was an old movie from the late 70s that was made in Canada and it has uh, a, a bunch of staples uh, from Canadian TV and movies mm. were actors in it uh, but it also had David Hemmings uh, and Donald Pleasance and Peter O'Toole with three staples oh. of British films at the time and they're all plotters uh, they're plotting a coup d'etat in this imaginary country uh, Donald Pleasance of course is the creepy head of secret police mm. you know in the government and David Hemmings and Peter O'Toole are two of the main coup plotters and they're kind of antagonists but they're on the same side seeking to overthrow the government um, so it's it's an interesting movie and it gave me there's a scene in the movie where David Hemmings as one of the main plotters is trying to recruit Peter O'Toole into the, the 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 plot against the government and he looks him up you know and uh, they're sitting there uh, verbally fencing back and forth while they're pretending to play a game of cards with each other yeah and uh, just trying to sound him out and get him inducted into the plot and they're using uh, you know a deck of ordinary playing cards and I thought okay uh, let's do a little you know let's have a small very small very fast game uh, about the plotting and execution of a coup d'etat mm. uh, in the two phases like that um, but using a deck of ordinary playing cards and this is one of the first games I've done uh, using a deck of ordinary yep. playing cards and I still think it's a fantastic system I've just finished in the last two years I've designed about five or six more games that use a deck of ordinary playing cards yep. in one way or another so it's a fantastic sort of set of mechanisms that you can uh, put into a, a game so those were the first couple of games that I started to design and uh, I returned to Canada uh, in 1992 and I started to do other games again on other unusual subjects that, that I found interesting. And uh, so I did games on the shining path of uh, Sendero Luminoso of Peru, so getting into insurgency, a game on the Tupamaro urban guerrillas uh, yeah. in Uruguay from 68 to 72. I did a game uh, that was almost contemporary with the uh, UN intervention in Somalia in 1993, mm. 1994, I was away. You know, I, I was just getting rolling on uh, games on subjects that few to no people had ever touched before, but things that I found interesting because they had political depth and military depth, and they also dealt with insurgency and counterinsurgency in some way. And that was how a, a, a sort of a niche that I started to carve out for myself. Um, not because this was something that nobody had done before. It's just like that wasn't my motivation to do things that I had done before. Because I would look at something and I would think, why hasn't somebody done yeah. anything like this before? Well, if no one's going to, maybe I should. Just to make more of what I wanted to see in the world. Yeah. It's something that I can relate to a lot. Like making a game just out of frustration for the game not existing. I have two follow-up questions to that. The first one is, why do you think those topics were not covered uh, traditionally by wargaming before uh, designers like you, then later Volko, uh, but you also have uh, Kim Kanger, for example, people like this. Uh, why wasn't it covered by, by other designers? Yeah, there's one name that I would add to that list, and that's Joe Miranda. Uh, yeah. Joe and I uh, were very much on the same wavelength of these sorts of things uh, back in, in the 90s when I started to, to, to get my start on designing. Um, I started writing articles for uh, uh, Strategy and Tactics magazine in the early 90s when Joe Miranda was editing it. And Joe has also uh, been interested in the area of, of insurgency and where politics and the military cross paths. Um, and Joe, his first published uh, game design was in Strategy and Tactics uh, about 1988-1989 uh, on Nicaragua. Mm. And this was uh, a game that, it was Joe's first published game, so it's got a rather, 
he took kind of a kitchen sink design to things. Uh, there was so much that he wanted to say about so many different insur uh, dimensions of an insurgency. There's party politics and covert and overt warfare and all this kind of stuff. So it's all rather a jumble. Uh, and there's an awful lot to take in at once. Um, but once things get rolling, you know, it's a really fun ride until the wheels start to fly off the bus. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a great ride to there. And very little that had been done in that vein had been published, you know, at, at least in, uh, and on, why, in why Americans. So, why do you think that's the case? So many, so few designs up until the late 90s, so few. And even when some were designed, they were the settings had to be changed to, uh, to yeah. space, like wh where do you think this comes from? I think a lot of it is simple, let's say, uh, I, guess, I guess a lot of disinterest. The one thing I've learned over the years is that board, and when I, when I speak of board war gamers, I'm speaking mostly of American board war gamers because the hobby is mostly dominated by Americans, um, you know, just in sheer numbers. And I found that by and large, they have uh, every, every, okay, every board war gamer is generally interested in history, unless they're completely into fantasy or mm. science fiction or something like that. But they're all interested in history generally. And they may have a very deep and encyclopedic knowledge of one or two periods of history. There are people who uh, specialize in World War II or American Civil War. Uh, over here, you have people who are in, fascinated by the English Civil War, that kind of thing. But by and large, they don't seem to be any more interested in contemporary events and contemporary history than people who don't play war games at all. Mm. Uh, they just seem kind of disconnected from it. Since 1945, the main mode of actual warfare between, you know, has been irregular warfare. It's been insurgencies or internal wars or civil wars or those sorts of things. There have been very few episodes of formalized state-on-state -state warfare. Yeah. You know, there's the several Arab-Israeli wars, um, the Falklands, which, you know, on the scale of World War II was just a skirmish. Yeah. You know, uh, no disrespect to the participants, of course. Yeah. You know, uh, nobody wants to die in a big war or a skirmish. Nobody Mm. Just people just don't want to die in a war, um, but by and large, uh, there's been very little of that sort of thing, and so uh, I guess there's there's a number of reasons. It, it's it's um, it's it's contemporary, so maybe for many people, it's just a little bit too. Uh, for, it's a little bit too recent, especially, of course, if they happen to, you know, know people or know people who know people who are involved in it. And, you know, of course, when Volko and I desi designed a distant plane on Afghanistan, this is 2012, 2013, the war wasn't over yet. And, you know, we had a number of discussions and a number of interviews, you know, with people who, uh, you know, who were, were genuinely concerned about why we would want to do something about a war that was still on. Yeah. You know, is it not trivializing things? Are you not cheapening things? Are you not being inherently disrespectful to people who may have uh, maybe personally involved in the conflict or who have brothers or husbands or, you know, what have you, uh, who are involved in the conflict? And... You know, it's uh, it's something that we were acutely conscious of, but I think it's important to do this kind of thing. Um, I design these games as a way of organizing my thinking. You know, I mentioned earlier about 1848. You know, I needed to organize my research and my thinking about the revolutions of 1848 in order to carry on, in this case, with, with finishing a long article about it. Uh, but it's kind of the same thing with, with contemporary conflict. I read accounts of it, I read uh, blog posts, I read, you know, the newspapers or books on something, uh, but if I want to really make sense of it, I'll study it and then try to make a model of it and systematize it in a game. And I try to do my homework, I try to, to show my work, and of course you try to be as even-handed as possible and to be as respectful as possible to the different viewpoints, you mm -hmm. know, that are, that are going on. And at the same time be very, very cognizant that while you're designing a game about a contemporary conflict, you are not trying to predict the outcome of the conflict. Yeah. This is an important point. Um, and people, you know, when they see games on contemporary conflict, they try to, to think of, of um, you know, okay, what are you predicting for this? And again, when Volko and I were working on A Distant Plane, you know, 2012, 2013, 
the war wasn't over yet. Uh, NATO was due to finish its combat mission in, in Afghanistan about 2014. So we were very explicit that to say that, okay, we're designing a game about a, a conflict that's not over yet, but the end point of this game is 2014. Mm. You know, so when it was published, there, you know, that, that part still had a, a year to run, but you, know, you could see yeah. the arc and where it was going to end. And we were careful to say from beginning to end, we are not predicting the ultimate end so when 2021 came around, of course, um, and the Afghan government finally collapsed, uh, everyone was saying, you know, uh, lots of people were writing, oh, you know, can you put together a 2021 scenario for this kind of thing? And, you know, the simple answer is no, I can't. Uh, and I won't because so much has happened between 2013 and 2021. So many changes have taken place outside of the frame of reference of mm. the game that you can't simply just write a new scenario and kind of burp it up onto the board and you know say okay well these cubes are over here now um, so many things had happened outside of the frame of reference and of course many of those events if you tried to reflect them in the model of the game would have to be deliberately weird bad and bizarre yeah. <laughs> methods of play uh, that you know it, it's it, you if you tried to co construct some kind of a 2021 version of the game in a distant plane, it would be unplayable, you know, as a scenario. Uh, it would just be, I mean, it, it was as if the coalition player has said, it stands up and says, okay, it's 10.30, the last bus home is at uh, 10.50, I have to be on it. And so this is my copy of the game. And he starts, you know, shoveling mm. the bits and pieces into the game into the game box and meanwhile the government player you know he has to get up early for work tomorrow as well so he's not really interested and uh so we just as as often happens when the last bus is about to leave you conduct a very hasty post-mortem on the game and they figure well taliban was probably closest to their victory conditions so um we'll just hand the victory to the taliban meanwhile you know, we got to get on the bus, we got to get up early tomorrow. Um, so, I mean, if someone insisted on a crude modeling of the 2021 situation, that's about how you would, you would, you would go about it. Uh, maybe well, there is one thing that I want to think about, uh, talk about, because you mentioned a couple of times a game on uh, 1848. Yeah. Uh, and there is actually a game that was added to uh, GMT's P500 recently by Jules. Uh, yep. And I was wondering, did you 27 have 27 a... years after I did my game? Yeah. The second game on 1848 is coming out. Yeah. You know. And there is a thing about French, young French designer coming mm -hmm. up to actually uh, make the games that you wanted to see 30 years ago. So there is a, a trend here. Mm -hmm. Have you reached out to Jules already to, to talk about his, his game? or? No, I haven't talked to Jules about it. I've been very busy with other yeah. projects. But I have been reading the things that he's been writing yeah. uh, and putting in the inside GMT mm -hmm. column where they just have little teaser bits about how he approached it. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, when I designed that 1848 game, I was still in my first, you know, five to seven years of designing. And um, I had a number of ideas about mechanics and things that I wanted to use. But um, at that point in the 90s, there hadn't quite been the cross hybridization you know between euro mechanics and war games yeah so war games were still kind of really stuck in the hexes and counters and stuff i generally don't do well i do some hex maps but i do a lot more of sort of irregular area movement kind yeah. of maps things which is what i was doing but i was um this was the first game on 1848 that kind of look that took a a, a sort of continental scale a look at things and at that time, there had been like a couple of games. There was a German card game about 1848. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was just, a, it was only cards. And it was just about the revolution, revolutionary figures in Germany itself. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody in, in France had done anything like that about, you know, the July days or, or anything like Not that. Not to my knowledge. It might have been like maybe Edition Descartes might have done something in, yeah. the, in the 80s, something like this, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, but as you say, you know, there had been... Um, you know, this was the first game that was kind of like a continental scale look at the revolutions of 1848. And now, you know, as I say, 27 years later, there's the second one is coming out. And it's, it's funny, too, because I did the first game on Sendero Luminoso in Peru. Yeah. And Stephen Reganzas yeah. is coming out with one about included, 20, 27 years later as well. Included in the guerrilla generation. Uh, yeah. 
I, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm really impressed by Steven's work. Um, yes. I'm impressed by his approach. Yep. I'm impressed by the depth of his research, by mm-hmm. the way he represents that in his game. Yeah. And I love this approach of having four small games in a box. Mm-hmm. Uh, at first, I wasn't sure about the whole idea. Mm. And after having played the four games of the British way, I realized how much insight it gave me uh, on counterinsurgency warfare by uh, the British Empire. And I didn't expect, I was like, yeah, of course, putting games in perspective is actually, uh, has a lot of value because this perspective gives you the information. It's like seeing with two eyes for the first time. It's like, oh, there is 3D actually. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So like, and having different points of view actually helps you better understand the object that you're looking at. Yeah. Which I thought was was really interesting. Have Have you played the British way? Not yet. It's on my shelf, yeah. but I've been very busy with other things. Well, maybe later we'll talk about urban warfare games, yeah. because next week, the, the reason why I'm in London is to attend the Connections UK conference, and I'll be speaking on a panel about urban warfare. But I really respect Stephen's approach. Stephen is, is an academic. Yeah. You know, He's very well researched. He's very thorough. He's done two things from a game design point of view uh, that are really clever. One is he's taken the, the GMT coin system, which was originally inspired by some of my games on the insurgency. There's a whole story there. But he's taken it and he's stripped it down to its very essentials. That's one thing. Um, And the other thing is he's rediscovered the the principle of putting four similar games in one box. The the, the major SPI, SPI was the major um, American war game publisher in the 70s. James Dunnigan, you know, created the, 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 um, the, uh, the company. SPI put out something like 300 different war game designs mm. uh, during its its run from about 1971 or so to 1982 when they finally went out of, went out of business. One of the best sellers that they had was something they called the Quadra game, and um, this was four games that were sold in one package, and they had one set of standard rules and then one set of uh, exclusive rules that. Um, changed the standard rules or supplemented them depending on the, sp- the specific battle. And uh, they had them on different campaigns. So there was like a West Wall quad, yeah. um, which was like a bulge thing and Remagen Bridge and stuff like that. Um, and they had games, uh, quadra games in all kinds of historical periods from the Thirty Years' War up to modern battles and some hypothetical battles um, at the time as well. And these things sold really, really well. People just loved them because there were four simple, smaller games that you could play fairly quickly and it, it, once you learn the exclusive rules then you could pick up on um, on uh, then you could play all four games um, so a, f- a couple of years ago through compass games i published um, brief border wars which is exactly the same approach um, so it's four uh, games uh, about brief, very brief border conflicts um, that has a set of standard rules and then four little booklets mm. uh, that are um, um, yeah, to, uh, that are relating to the specific conflict. Volume 2, people really liked it, and Volume 2 of Brief Border Wars is coming out maybe the end of this year or next yeah. year. But just the idea of having four smaller, fairly straightforward things that you can learn uh, and then get right into it and get to the action and play it in, I, I think, an hour or 90 minutes or something like that is something that pe- people really, uh, it, it really appeals to them. That's two very clever things that he's done. And of course, Stephen is a very clever man to begin with. You know, I, I really admire the depth of his research and the take mm. that, he's, he, that he has on these things. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to see. So yes, there's the British way. And uh, of course, Stephen is coming out with another collection called the Gorilla Generation. Which are those? There's a Shining Path. There is uh, Salvador, Peru. El Salvador, Peru. Um, Uruguay, the Tupamaros, and I can't remember the fourth one. But again, it's interesting because two of my early... So Salvador, Nicaragua, Peru, and Uruguay. Uruguay, yeah, that's right. And that's interesting because two of my early game designs, um, I did one on Peru, uh, The Shining Path of Peru in 1994, and about the same time I did one on the Tupamaro uh, urban guerrillas in Uruguay. Um, so here we are, uh, 27 odd years later, 25, 27 years later, and now the second game on Shining Path is coming out. The second ever game on, on the Tupamaros is coming out. The Tupamaros actually uh, is a really, really interesting case study because this was a strictly urban guerrilla movement. 
And this was um, uh, an insurgency that essentially grew, lived, and died all within, essentially all within one city of Montevideo, a city at the time of about one and a half million people. And it's quite remarkable to think of this whole thing kind of flourishing and then being extinguished, uh, I mean, along with democracy itself, uh, in Uruguay at the time. And so that was an early game of mine, and it was one where I took a different approach to designing uh, games and, and game mechanics, because up until then, most people really just looked on games uh, as a map and counter exercise. And maps, of course, have to be uh, a, a picture of the ground, you know, and they have to relate to the ground, and then the counters have to have, represent discrete military forces. Um, but with Tupamaro, uh, instead of, uh, there was no point in doing a map, a, a physical map of the city, it was pointless. Um, and there was no need for the standard kind of time and space dilemmas, mm. you know, that uh, where people try to get the scale and the time and motion uh, and studies right um, in, a, in a standard battle kind of war game. So instead, the map was a map of attitudes. It was a map of social sector areas, uh, different slices of society in Uruguay, and the different attitudes that they had towards one side or the other. The different uh, pieces, which represented, you know, different armed groups, you know, in some cases government troops, in other cases um, in police informers or, you know, uh, different front groups and that kind of thing would be hopping back and forth, you know, all mm. over the city, you know, doing one thing or another. And they had very asymmetrical menus of actions, you know, that they could, uh, things that they could do. So the government not only had to fight the insurgency, but they also had to kind of semi-manage the economy uh, in order to fund, you know, the insurgency, or the, the counterinsurgent methods um, and what they were doing. And so, I found that really liberating to just simply throw away the idea of, of uh, a map as, as just a, a piece of ground yeah. uh, or, a, or, or a representation of a physical structure and instead um, just uh, treat it abstractly and to treat the action in the game very abstractly as well. Um, and that in turn fed into a family of games that, uh, you know, like, well, after Tupamaro, I did the, the Shining Path game, and the map there is a map of the entire country of Peru, you know, divided into different departments. But again, we have the same kind of area of, uh, of thinking of, uh, you know, sort of underground forces that come into the open, and they're engaged, and then they go back underground, and then they move around. And uh, I used that system with variations uh, for uh, further games on um, like the Greek Civil War, um, Afghanistan, and the Algerian War. And uh, the, the, this uh, was the, this Algerian game was something I did about the year 2000. Mm. And that was, as far as I could tell, the first game to be published on the Algerian War, at the strategic level at least, in any language. And through a string of circumstances, Volko Runka um, saw this game being played um, when he was a teacher at the Sherman Kent School, uh, which is where the CIA teaches its uh, mi mi um, military analysts. And that partly inspired him, um, based on design work that he had already done, to come up with the GMT coin system. He uh, put that together into his first uh, game in the coin system, and Day in Abyss, which was about the insurgency in Colombia. And I ended up unconsciously being one of the playtesters for and Abyss, and I, uh, I was playing it at a board game convention, and I was thinking, this is a really clever design. Volko mm -hmm. is really onto something here. But I didn't see, at the time, I didn't realize that, you know, Volko had made reference to my work, and it wasn't until the game was actually published and it came out in the playbook that Volko acknowledged his intellectual debt you know, that I had partly inspired some of the mechanics, mm. you know, in the coin system. And it, that's really touching because everybody talks about how Volko is, is such a, um, a generous and helpful person. And he really is. He's just a, a, a prince of a guy. And he, and he acknowledges, you know, his, inspi his inspirations and his intellectual debts. And I really, really respect that. And whenever possible, I do the same myself because it's not the game designers war game designers we're not a closed community you know we're always borrowing and stealing yeah. stuff from each other 
And, you know, it's, it's only polite to kind of name check mm. um, and to acknowledge your inspirations because there's an awful lot of in incredible creativity. There's a lot of depth of thought and knowledge and inventiveness that, that comes through this kind of thing. And that's what I find really, that, that's what's really sustained a lot of my thought, my involvement, because I've been playing war games for over 40 years now, um, and I've been designing for over 30, and it's just really stimulating. You know, it's a creative outlet for me. It's not lucrative at all. It, 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 it isn't for anyone, really, but it's a wonderful creative outlet. But more to the point, it brings me into contact with these uh, very creative, intelligent, um, inventive people. And uh, it's just so, uh, it's, it's, it's so inspiring, you know, and uh, it keeps me happy and it keeps me involved. And, you know, takes me to different places. Yeah. Uh, I've been involved in sort of the, uh, the, the, the sort of, the, the world of, you know, the Connections Conference, the professional wargaming end of thing, uh, things. I've been involved in that for, I guess, about the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Uh, off and on been involved in that kind of thing. Uh, there are some, you know, contributions that uh, th this uh, that hobbyists or hobby gamers, uh, you know, uh, civilian gamers can make to the professional world um, in some respects. But again, you know, let's go back to what we were talking before about the general um, disinterest of most war gamers in contemporary affairs. After 9/11, I was expecting some kind of uh, real, yeah. up, uh, some kind of awakening, some kind of upsurge in serious war games about counterinsurgency and counterterrorism and that kind of thing, because there, were, of course, there was an explosion of, of blogs and books and films and things like that about terrorism and, and where it came from. Um, but it wasn't reflected in, in, in games generally, and it certainly wasn't, it, it wasn't even reflected in video games. You know, video games, computer games, it, 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 there really was very little uh, about that, you know, above the level of a trivial first-person shooter. Hmm. People just weren't willing to, to come to, to, um, to terms with it. It did it, change afterwards, because if you look, like Modern Warfare, the, the first-player shooter was definitely this, uh, Rainbow Six, also went really hard into the counter uh, insurgency, counter terrorism thing. And if you look at board games, it's not massive, but you still had some really big war games like yeah. uh, Labyrinth, all yeah. the coin games, the game that you've done with, with Voco on, on the war in Afghanistan. And that's the question that I have is like, do you feel like today, it feels like there is a lot more of those games that you were looking for when 30 years ago. So, do you like mm. the do you like the do you like the the uh, the war gaming scene today more than than it what it was? Do you feel it more? It appeals more to what you're interested in, or do you still feel that maybe the the the, the war the war game designer caught up on some of your interests, but they they never. They are still missing some things. How do you feel about that? I think they're still missing some things. Yeah. There's more than there was, but before there was almost nothing. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, uh, Joe Miranda and I were kind of the two main guys who were putting out uh, games on contemporary conflicts. Um, and even now, I would be hard pressed to name more than 20 to 30 game titles that were really serious explorations of the conflicts of the last 25 years. Yeah. And maybe about 25 titles uh, I could name, you know, that, that relate to the, the conflicts of the last 30 years. And Joe or I have been, re have been responsible or involved in some way with more than half of them. Um, so it's still something that's restricted to a fairly small circle of people. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit restrictive, you know, in my, uh, you know, in, in, in drawing a circle around it. But, you know, what I'm thinking of in for serious, you know, sort of like strategic or operational scale, um, you know, looks at, at, at the insurgencies or counterinsurgencies that have been going on. Um, there is now a, a level of, of interest that there wasn't before because of the in, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
you know, so a number of people are working on Ukraine designs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in a way, they there's, there's a debate going on over that. Yeah, there is a debate going on over, on over that. But it, I find it interesting that people started designing games on Ukraine like one year in. And whereas it was absolutely not the case for Afghanistan, absolutely not the case for Iraq. And it feels like as soon as the war is a tiny bit kinetic, it's covering an area that looks yes. where it was the East Front. Yep. And it's like, and if people feel like, oh, it's a territory where I'm more comfortable. And they go back exactly. in a way, t tackling Ukraine feels for me like going back to, oh, we're going to have a, yep. a modern East Front game, which yeah. a lot of those uh, 1980s uh, Cold War Gone Hot games were the same. Oh. It's like, and it, it feels like we're gamers are still stuck in that thing. It's like, oh, Good God, I'm, I'm finally going to be able to talk about something modern, but yes. in a way that is so reassuring to no, me. So you put your finger right on it. And frankly, it is th this whole phenomenon of people like I was gaming all through the 80s and I played my share of, you know, uh, NATO games about Cold War gone hot in the 80s. But that was during the 80s, yeah. you know, uh, I, when it was a matter of contemporary but still hypothetical interest. And I was in the military, you know, and that sort of thing. And I found that sort of thing, you know, professionally and, and, pri and personally interesting. But going back to this, you know, 20, 30 years after the end of the Cold War and recasting this huge kinetic conflict that never actually happened. It's a bizarre, bizarre exercise in, I don't know what it is. It's just like the last gasps of nostalgia fumes or a weird kind of retro futurism. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's very odd. But you're right, as soon as we get back into the kinetic, I'm sure a lot of people went back and, and they, they uh, got out their 1943 and 1944 maps of Ukraine and figure, oh, well, geez, if we can only have like some German troops, you know, commit themselves to fighting in Ukraine, you know, somebody's grandfather and somebody's grandson could both have been fighting, you know, and for they're using And they're using uh, German tanks. Yeah, so, so, that's right. Yes. So in a sense, it's kind of looping back to that. But you're right, to ignite interest in it, it's got to be kinetic. It's got to be, you know, at least the idea of tank, you know, tank divisions fighting each other. And of course, it's not that. I, I designed a game on Ukraine in 2014. Over the very weekend of the sham referendum, yep. you know that uh, over the, the 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 future of the Crimea in March 2014, uh, it was the, the the weekend. You know there was a weekend coming up. It's the middle of March, and I had the weekend, and I thought, well, I've got a weekend. Uh, what should I do? Should I publish or should I design a political, military, uh, and information warfare? three-dimensional design on the Ukrainian crisis. Well, yes, I've got the weekend. Let's do this. And I took the weekend and I did that. Um, and the game is called Ukrainian Crisis. And I put it together in two or three days, put it up for free print and play on my website. And it's still there nowadays. Um, and uh, I got I, picked I, up by Hollenspiel. Yes, it did. It got picked up by Hollenspiel a couple of years later. And we made a few uh, changes to the design. Basically, you know, we, we straightened out a few of the uh, of the events, and mm. uh, because we could, uh, the, the publication allowed us a, a, a little bit more co components. We could extend the game, you know, by adding a couple of cards and adding a couple of turns to the game. But it's essentially the same design. And I managed to publish that game to my website uh, on the Monday of the weekend. So the very day of the Crimean referendum, I had a game out on it. And I had a tremendous number of, of, of visitors to, uh, to my website, you know, on that day and for the succeeding week, because, you know, word just spreads through the internet, oh, there's a game. But uh, everybody clicked in and saying, oh, it's not a computer game. Oh, I have to, make I have the to effort. download yeah. it. Oh, I have to print it. To you know, learn so. the rules, I cannot just click around. Yeah. yeah, so I can't just click on things. So everybody came in, had a look, <laughs> and then clicked away again. So I have no way of knowing um, how many people actually have gone to the trouble of downloading and building yeah. their own copies of, uh, of this game. It's still a really popular download item uh, mm -hmm. on, my, uh, on my website. Now, of course, this was, again, uh, an example, I think, of analog board game design as a form of citizen journalism, because here I am trying to organize my thoughts and not exactly my predictions, but, you know, trying to 
trying to build kind of a model, uh, kind of a framework mm. for how the conflict could go or yeah. could be resolved in these three different dimensions of the sort of like the political dimension of getting countries to line up or not line up one way or the other, the potential for, uh, for irregular and kinetic, you know, uh, uh, violent action, and then there's the dimension of information warfare. And the common currency among these three is, uh, well, I use the word prestige for it. It, it, it encompasses a number of different ideas, but that was just the sort of uh, idea uh, or, 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 or uh, label that I mm. put on that particular kind of thing. Um, that's the common currency between these three spheres of action in the game. And, but the, the game, which again, you know, I, I, I put out at the time of the crisis itself when it was launched, when it looked like there could be a large and overt Russian invasion that never actually happened, the, 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 the game is really only applicable to, the, to, that, to that period and the following six months because by September of that year, they had the first Minsk agreement, which kind of brought a ceasefire to things and um, the likelihood of a Russian overt invasion kind of receded. So that game is of its time, and it's applicable to about six, a six month stretch in 2014. Um, so again, not a model for what was going to happen in 2022. And uh, when the tension was being ratcheted up, you know, at, at, at the beginning of 2022, um, people were asking again, hey, why don't you put together a 2022 scenario for this? And I said, no, because, well, for two reasons. One, there had been so many different changes between, you know, in the, in the, in the intervening eight years. You know, there's a complete transformation in the quality and quantity of the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, the different countries that could be involved, you know, one way or another. You know, it, it had already, there'd already been some complete realignments like that. And so there was just no way it could be done. And also I thought at the time that there would not be the kind of invasion that actually happened. Um, but again, that's, that's another, that's another story. Yeah. But just to wrap up this discussion, I had one final question. Actually I had 12 final questions, but I'm gonna, just gonna pick this one. <laughs> just going back to that discussion that we we're having around the lack of interest, why it doesn't necessarily resonate, where there are not that many games that have been released, why there are still quite a few designers that are interested in making those games. And it's true that when we think about those games, compared to the number of games on the American Civil War that keep being released, mm -hmm. like it's, there is no contest here. Uh, yes. And, and it's, it's quite interesting. Do you think it's because designers like you, and I would actually include myself, people like Steven, uh, people like Volko, are actually not designing war games, but they are talk designing political games, talking about war, and not war games. And at its core, there is actually a divide here that we refuse to admit and acknowledge, is that there is actually a big audience that we're talking to, because we talk about topics that might somewhat resonate with them, but at the core, the hobby, a lot of, a big part of the hobby is still really focused on pure kinetic warfare games. And there is actually a difference in nature in the games that are being done. And this pops up when there are debates around what is a war game, what is this, what is part of the hobby, not part of the hobby. And actually the hobby is maybe more diverse than what people accept it to be, but also maybe there is a natural, like a maybe more fundamental distinction between, between those games and the games that you are making are, actually you are not a war game designer, Brian. Mm -hmm. You are not at all. And, and, and how do you feel about that? Yeah. Well, um, hmm, yeah, I, 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 where to start here? You're, you're right in that I think the bulk of war gamers are still people who are interested in episodes of kinetic warfare, uh, and they're comfortable in, uh, in, in tackling a conflict at a scale and a level of involvement where the political and soft factors are not as much of a, and a, a, they're, they're not as much of a problem. So they, and these are people who tend, uh, some of them tend to treat these things as almost as mathematical puzzles. Yeah. Uh, and I call it yeah. collaborative sudoku, uh, competitive sudoku. Yeah. And people hate this, yeah. but it is competitive sudoku. Oh, this yes. Is what, yeah. yeah. And, and you see this in uh, like people like uh, naval war gamers, for yeah. example. You know, uh, if, you, if you're playing a game about the Battle of, J of Jutland, for example, something like that, it's all about ballistics and, and, and metallurgy and, you know, angles of attack and stuff like that. That's very mathematical. 
Um, and, and tactical games are generally like that. Tactical games are popular. They have always been very popular. You don't have to worry about the sort of like the political background or context for this sort of thing. And, you know, if you're fighting a desert war game, you know, the political balance of power, you know, in the Mediterranean, uh, you know, has nothing to do with the penetrative powers of a two-pounder gun. Uh, but why is that two-pounder gun sitting, defending Tobruk, you know, in, 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 at that particular point in time? Um, but that's something that, by and large, people don't really want to engage with. And, you know, I'm not going to condemn that. You no. know, let people enjoy things. You know, this is a hobby that people should be able to enjoy at a number of different levels and just have different levels of personal engagement. But don't and you so think there, there might be something problematic about let people enjoy things? Going back to the example of the American Civil War, there is a lot of those games mm, yes. that go really deep into the Lost Cause narrative. And should we yeah, really let people yes. enjoy things? Or should we look at those games and say, you know what, this game that you enjoy a lot, it says a lot about you, or you're actually being influenced in a way that you don't even expect. Yes. And maybe we shouldn't let them just enjoy things. And maybe we should <laughs> say, well, you know what, those games, they are talking about actual historical events. There is a context around it. It is actually not frivolous a topic. Yes. And maybe we need to talk about it seriously. No, you are, you're absolutely right. People should be allowed to enjoy things, but they should also be able to understand mm. and articulate why and how they're enjoying them. They need to be honest about that. Yeah. And you're exactly right. The kind of entertainment or pastimes that people consume, it says just as much about them. You know, it says more about them than about the original designer or film director or novelist mm. or you know, painter, whatever it is that you're, you happen to be consuming. And yes, people need to be, to be upfront about that. They need to be aware of the historical and political context of things. Otherwise, it is kind of a toy soldier exercise. Yeah. You know? and, and yes, there's an awful lot of stuff. And I, that's always been my, my beef with a lot of this. Is that a lot of this is just simply missing the point. It's just eliding you know, the, the, the history and the context of these kinds of things. So you and me and Stephen and Volko Yes, in a way, we are political game designers. We design games about politics that happen to have a, a, a somewhat kinetic, abstracted kinetic dimension. Games and models, they're all abstractions. And it's, uh, that's basically how it is. It's just, where do you put the abstraction? Where do you put the level of abstraction, more or less, on the political dimension or the, or the, the sort of kinetic or mathematical dimension of things? How mechanistically, you know, uh, how linearly uh, and algebraically do you want to treat these things? Mm. How non-linear do you want to get? And, you know, there are a number of games out there. Labyrinth, for example, is, is, is one where you have these sort of series of cascading and second order effects. That's how, that, that's maybe a little bit better model of how the real world works. Um, and you can't be so linear and deterministic about it. Of course, you know, it's an optimistic exercise to try to make a model of the world in that way. Because a lot of what really happens in the world are things that we could never have thought of, or, or generally couldn't have thought of in, in war games. But there's always been the potential there. Yeah. And I'm happy to see that people are exploring that potential. Over the years, recently, there's been more and more of a cross-fertilization of Euro game mechanics. There's more openness towards cards. People are more and more open to the idea of how long is a turn and about asymmetry between players. Yeah. Those are all really healthy developments, I think. And that's the thing, and I will conclude the, here because talking about this, and I had a similar discussion with Maurice Suckling a couple of months yeah. ago around uh, the influence of uh, Euro games on his design, but also in, in war game or political game uh, yep. design as a whole, and how it gave uh, uh, designers tools to actually approach problems in a different way. Yes. And I think that would be a, an excellent panel to have with you, Maurice Volko and I don't know, somebody else that we can think about, just to talk about those things, because I think there is clearly, there is a topic that is here that nobody talks about, but it has a major impact over uh, political and war game designs over the course of the last 20 years. I think would be interesting to discuss uh, at some point from a war gaming's perspective. But I wanted to thank you for taking the time to uh, answer a few of my questions because of your very lengthy answers, but that was super interesting. You'd be back on the channel anyway, so that's, uh, that's fine. It was great to have you and, and being able to record this in person and not 
in front of a laptop that was actually pretty great and now we have to go and go have lunch so thanks again uh, see you soon thanks everyone for watching bye bye and uh, see you next time thank you everyone yeah and if you um if you want me to kind of uh close down on something or speed up or whatever uh i mean i, d I don't know what your upper limit for um these kind of things are but yeah, uh, sometimes I can go for a long time if, if you let me and yeah. uh, there's no reason to expect you to have to try and edit that. <laughs>